Welcome back to another deep dive of the Warhammer 40k lore. We're going to take it back to chaos as we get into the ways that the chaos gods corrupt other factions outside of humanity. So the corruption of orcs, tau, necrons, and what that looks like. And let's start off with a faction in 40k that you would never imagine could be corrupted by chaos, but they might be. The corruption of necrons. With the opening of the Great Rift and the expansion of dozens of warp portals all over the galaxy, chaos in all of its form has become one of the biggest threats facing not just the Imperium of Man, but every single faction in the Milky Way galaxy. Not since the Age of Strife have the Chaos Gods and their legions of demons had so much access to the material world. From warp storms to demonic incursions, it seems as if the corruption of chaos is finally reaching a boiling point. But of all the major races in the 40k universe, the Necrons stand the best chance at pushing back and defeating the forces of chaos. While it's easy to underestimate the Necron race, as for the last thousand years the dynasties were barely coming out of their great sleep, and the full military might of these ancient rulers was not at their disposal, the truth is that now more than ever, the tomb worlds are fully functional and ready to reconquer the galaxy that they believe is rightfully theirs. The Necrons are no strangers to fighting a psychically powerful enemy. As a matter of fact, they have the most experience fighting the forces of the Immaterium. As 60 million years ago, the Necrons waged a war in heaven against the Old Ones, an ancient race whose mastery over the Immaterium was so powerful that they created the Webway, a feat that no other intelligent species has been able to accomplish. And they also were able to biologically engineer psychically powerful warrior races like the Eldar and the Krork. Not having psychic powers themselves, the Necrons developed technologies with the help of the Catan that would manipulate the warp and its energies. Using black stone, which is a very rare substance that possesses the ability to not only nullify the psychic energies of the Immaterium, but also absorb them and then redirect the energy in explosive ways. They utilized this material to build planet-destroying weapons and defensive structures that helped them win the war in heaven. Now, one of the first arguments against the Necrons' battle with Chaos is that the Old Ones cannot be compared to the demons of the Immaterium. And it's somewhat true, as the turmoil and chaos caused by so many psychically powerful races in the current galaxy has empowered the forces of Chaos, and they are much more aggressive and stronger than the Old Ones ever were. But the Necrons have been in this situation before. They've been the underdog. They were completely outgunned and outmaneuvered during the War in Heaven, but somehow they still managed to use their physics-bending technology to eventually cause the enemy to flee the galaxy. And the Necrons of today's time are preparing to do the exact same thing. The only difference is that they already possess this technology, it's just sitting there waiting. All across the galaxy, the Necrons left behind pylon structures, similar to the pylons on Cadia that were holding back the Eye of Terror. These defensive structures are capable of creating tetrahedral regions of space that are completely immune to the Immaterium. So while the forces of chaos have relied on summoning warp storms that allow the Immaterium to bleed into real space and more of the legions of chaos to invade a planet, the Blackstone pylons of the Necrons have the ability to clear the warp storm away, taking away chaos's initiative. This is a counterattack used by the Necrons most recently in the Pariah Nexus, which shows how powerful the technology really is. Not only were the forces of chaos affected, but every psychically sensitive being was reduced to an empty shell, almost as if their soul was completely erased. So no matter how powerful the chaos demons are, it means nothing if they can't even get into real space. The major downside to this form of warfare is the logistics of the entire ordeal, because like I stated before, Blackstone is not readily available. Not only is it hard to find, but the other races like the Imperium of Man have begun to mine for this precious war material, meaning that the Necrons' war against Chaos will inevitably cause tension with the other major races, so Necron has to fight a war on multiple fronts. That and the dynasties have to use a lot of resources to reawaken and maintain the nullifying nexuses like the one we saw at the Pariah Nexus. The Necrons also seem to have the element of surprise on their side, because whenever these structures are discovered, the enemy doesn't seem to realize how powerful they truly are. It took Abaddon the Despoiler 13 attempts until he finally realized that he could simply destroy the pylons on Cadia and it would allow the warp portal to grow. 13 times! And it doesn't seem like this threat is shared amongst the Chaos forces, because after the destruction of Cadia and the birth of the Great Rift, warp storms erupted all over the Ultima Segmentum. One in particular unintentionally disrupted a Necron construct known as the Imga Monolith. 
after spreading across three star systems, the warp storm designated as Cerberix was stopped by a perfect sphere of order created by this ancient construct. It didn't take long before the forces of chaos bled out of the Immaterium and attempted to destroy the Necron monolith. Only the demons of Korn, who presumably weren't affected by the psyker cancelling effects of the monolith, were able to assault the construct. This conflict became known as the Cerberax Wars, as the Necrons answered with the full military might of the Saltec dynasty. Their warships formed a defensive shield around the monolith as it absorbed the psychic energies from the warp storm and somehow recycled that energy to physically duplicate any Necron warship that made contact with it. This obviously made the Necron force grow massive in size, and the two factions battled on every world within 1400 Terran souls of the monolith. Humanity was forced to join the fight as many of these planets were formerly controlled by the Imperium. Unfortunately, they began to enact exterminatus on the majority of the bordering planets. Now, how powerful the Necron force will become from this conflict is of great concern to the Imperium of Man, but it highlights how prepared the Necrons are in the battle against the forces of chaos. This is just one of many possible war constructs sitting and waiting to be rediscovered by the Necron dynasties and it proves that these constructs do much more than just simply nullify the warp like the pylons on Cadia. This isn't to say that no Chaos Force could defeat a Necron Tomb World, as not all Tomb Worlds are built the same and they have access to different amounts of resources. A small Necron Force on a Fringe World or even a Core World, for example, could get swept away by a demonic incursion, but the forces of Chaos would have a much harder time defeating a fully functional Crown World. Emphasis on the fully functional, because as I stated in the beginning of the video, a Necron world that only has its most basic defense protocols is just a sitting duck. Such was the case for the tomb world of Vorkath, when the demon prince Sokath Voidmaw invaded the planet and by the time the Necron Lord was awakened, his entire legion had already been corrupted by chaos. This corruption could also happen to a fully functional Necron force, as the protocols of the basic Necron warriors can be controlled by any malicious scrap code, just like Chaos corrupts the machines of the Omnissiah or the drones of the Tau Empire, but it's harder to enact such a wide-scale corruption when the cryptex of a tomb world would be awakened and operational, defending their tomb world. Now let's move over to a faction that is just as rare for Chaos to corrupt the Tau Empire. Let's first analyze what Chaos Corruption looks like for the Tau. Within the lore, there are two types of corrupted mortal beings. There are the Servants of Chaos that willfully venerate their god. These take the form of Chaos Cultists or Sorcerers. And then there are the Victims of Corruption. These are beings that are either tricked into furthering the schemes of the Ruinous Powers with very little knowledge of what Chaos actually is, or are inadvertently exposed to the etheric powers of the Immaterium, like when a Geller field malfunctions during warp travel. When it comes to the Tau, they are almost always the unlucky ones whose ignorance of the Immaterium makes them fall prey to the Ruinous Powers. In their exploration of the galaxy, the Tau Empire has stumbled upon the remains of warp portals, chaotically tainted relics, and sometimes even warp-touch Xeno species that ooze out the taint of chaos. Their curiosity proves to be their downfall as they attempt to understand these cursed items or people, and in the process, fall victim to corruption. An excellent example of this tragedy occurred when the Tau Earthcast began to investigate captured or abandoned Imperial vessels, and found that the ship's warp drive leaked a strange reality-bending energy that led to disturbing and bizarre incidences. The Earthcast engineers began to experience strange thoughts, poltergeist, ailments, and even death the longer they worked on these human machines. Eventually, the Ethereal cast had to put an end to the experimenting, and now are always on the lookout for any piece of Warp Touch technology that might have similar negative effects. Now let's talk about the rare instances where a Tau becomes a servant of the Ruinous Powers. Somehow, they acquire the knowledge of all of the abilities that could be bestowed upon them by a Chaos God, and actively venerate him and will perform various deeds in the hope of earning his favor and his gifts. When this occurs, the Tau Cultus operates as covertly as possible, scheming behind the Ethereal's back and always under the direction of demonic entities. And sadly, there is no real way that the Tau Empire could spot one of these types of traitors until they slip up and show that they are no longer working for the best interest of the greater good. An example of this would be a watercast diplomat with direct contact to psychically powerful Xeno species. If not properly supported by other members of his own cast with experience of the dangers of dealing with psychers, they can easily become enthralled into the web of lies spun by followers of Zinch and Slanesh. 
and by the time the diplomat reveals his cards, he has already done the unthinkable and taken the lives of his own fellow Tao. And the reason this particular form of venerating corruption seems so rare is because of all of the checks and balances applied to each caste within the strict Tao culture. Monitoring, questioning, and constant reporting are all simple methods used by the ethereals to detect any form of corruption. Now, whether or not they are directly or passively corrupted, once exposed to the Chaos Gods, there are usually three forms of manipulation that are used on their victims. There is the most evident form of corruption that we're going to call mutation. This is when the corruptive powers of the warp radically alter a mortal's form, giving him angelic wings with eyes, replacing limbs with squirming tentacles, or fusing the organic with machine. This is what plague zombies and the Galvorback are, usually corrupted beings whose new figure is unsettling to anyone in real space. The majority of the time, the Tau do mutate when exposed to chaotic corruption, and this is because they never biologically evolved a way to deal with large amounts of psychic energy. Unlike other races in the galaxy that have at least a few psychically sensitive individuals or were exposed to small and controlled amounts of warp energy, the Tau have none of this. And so when psychic energy flows around and through their small and incompetent bodies, it can't cope with the foreign power, becoming damaged and succumbing to the mutagenic effects of the warp. Demonic horns sprout from their craniums, their bones are elongated and deformed, strange new limbs rip through their flesh, and their minds are lost in the maddening effects of the immaterium. The same outcome occurs if a Tau warrior catches one of Nurkle's diseases like Nurkle's rot. The body begins to mutate in whatever form the god of pestilence chooses. To make it even worse, these disfigured Tau become easy pickings for demonic possession. This is when a predatory demon exits the warp and carves out a home inside the body of a sentient being in real space. The Tau continues to inhabit its own body, but loses much of the controls to the demonic entity. It's one of the worst possible scenarios for a Chaos Tau to experience because the demon allows the conscious mind of the Tau to continue to perceive everything that's happening around him, including the sensation of pain, but is completely helpless to stop it. The Tau is literally trapped in his own body. Eventually, the demon will get tired of torturing its victim and leave the body only to have it become a Chaos Spawn, a giant, twisted, mindless abomination forever tied to the service of the Chaos Gods. The second form of manipulation we get when the tower exposed to chaos we will call sorcerous blessings. This is when the chaos gods find or target a worthy servant and give them the opportunity to manipulate real space through the use of warp powers. Although this continued use of the sorcerous powers might lead to mutation, for the most part the corruption is not noticeable. This form of corruption allows a mortal to hide his allegiance to chaos while still using the gifts of chaos, like being able to shoot out warp lightning or open portals into the immaterium. Examples of this are thrall wizards and radical inquisitors. And remember that they don't always have to be active participants in the corruption, so individuals that discover ancient weapons imbued with the powers of chaos fall into this category. For the most part, the Tau race is oblivious to this form of corruption. They simply stumble upon a piece of technology that proves to be useful, but is actually chaotically tainted. This can take the form of blueprints or instructions on how to create a demon engine, recovering an ancient relic from a dead race that's actually a chaotic relic, or even finding a strange stone that whispers of future events to whoever carries it in its pocket. Eventually, the corrupted device will choose to return to its rightful demonic owner, or attempt to manipulate the user to perform evil deeds as payments for its use. The process of corruption varies according to the Chaos God's needs, and with very little knowledge of the deceitful ways of the warp, many members of the greater good fall directly into demon traps just like this. When it comes to the history of the Tao, this form of corruption is rumored to be what is happening to Farsight and his use of the Dawnblade. Discovered on the dead world of Arthas Moloch, this unique alien relic steals the life energy of a being cut down by the sword and adds it to the wielder. This is why Commander Farsight has been able to live for almost three Terran centuries, outliving most of his fellow Tau. As of now, no demonic corruption is visible, but what's a couple of centuries to the long game of the Chaos Gods? And finally, the least interesting form of corruption we're going to call Coercion. This is when the ruinous powers use a mortal being as a pawn in their scheme and offer no chaotic reward. They simply manipulate the victim's emotions to get their desired outcome. Examples of this are greedy planetary governors who curse the trillions of lives under their care in exchange for trade deals that will eventually fall through and leave their planets exposed to famine, becoming easier prey to the chaos gods. 
For the Tau, this affects any high-ranking member of a cast, and oftentimes the result is not very apparent. The manipulation is usually one of many in a long chain of cause and effects that only the Chaos Gods can predict. The seeds of corruption are subtle and could be more widespread than anyone has ever imagined, with the Chaos God's goal being to cultivate a stronger psychic presence within the soul for the Tau. Now that we understand how Chaos would corrupt a Tau, we have to talk about why they seldom choose to go after the Tau. And the answer lies in the psychic presence they emit. You see, every sentient being registers in the warp, and the Chaos entities are drawn to the strongest of these dimensional outlines that connect real space and the Immaterium. When compared to the rest of the galaxy, the Tau's impression is overlooked by the majority of these demons, because it simply isn't bold enough. However, this lack of attraction has proven to be a huge benefit for the Tau, as the Chaos Gods would much rather unleash their legions of soul-sucking demons into a heavily populated Imperial world more than an equally populated Sept world. A similar phenomenon occurred when the Tau first entered the Immaterium, like when they first attempted to use the Star Tide Nexus by making small hops into the warp. On one occasion, the ship was inside the Dark Realm for a bit too long, and the demons targeted the non-Tau auxiliary races rather than the Tau race themselves. This bias by the demons was no coincidence, because given the limited opportunity to harvest souls, they went for the mortals with the stronger psychic presence. But as I mentioned before, the Chaos Gods might be scheming to strengthen the psychic power within the Tau. We simply have to wait and see if Chaos Tau will become more prevalent in 40k. I hope you guys are seeing a pattern. The corruption of chaos hits humanity the hardest because they are the easiest to corrupt. Necrons and Tau have been difficult, and another faction that's extremely difficult to corrupt is the Tyranids. So let's take a look at how Slanesh would corrupt the Tyranids. Now the first thing I want you guys to understand is that chaos corruption of the Tyranids is not your typical form of corruption. Most commonly when we look at humanity's devotion to the ruinous powers, there is a consciously minded individual that seeks out the patronage of a chaos god. They either give up their soul, venerate the god, or work to further the schemes of this chaotic patron. However, this evil journey that a corrupted individual takes is usually triggered by a deception of chaos. For example, in the case of Nurgle worshippers, they accept the relief from pain that Nurgle gives them, but that pain was caused by the disease of Nurgle. In the case of Zinchian worshippers, their thirst for knowledge of sorcery is only created when Zinch gives them information that would otherwise not be available to them in the first place. And in all of these cases, there is a deliberate pact between the god and the individual where the traitor receives a chaotic gift he is looking for in exchange for the acceptance of the ruinous powers. Now this common style of embracing the demonic can only really be done by sentient beings with free will, because it's a true devil's bargain, and in the case of the Tyranids, they don't have free will. I'll use the example that I have in my Nurgle Tyranid lore video, where the hive mind protects and denies a bioform from turning to Nurgle even when the disease is running rampant inside their bodies and they're in terrible pain. It's the hive mind that actually controls the Tyranid. However, even though there is no way that a Tyranid bioform can consciously embrace chaos and become a traditional chaos cultist where he is devoted to a chaos god, there is still chaotic corruption in the form of the trigger that was placed there by the chaos god to try to force a creature into his service. In the case of Nurgle, it's easy to understand because it's the warp disease, but when you deal with the Prince of Pleasure Slanesh, the initial seed of corruption is harder to see. On the very rare occasion when Slanesh sets his attentions on a Tyranid high fleet, the Prince of Pleasure extends his gifts to these truly alien creatures, not in the hopes of turning the entire high fleet to chaos, but rather using the Tyranids as a tool to create even more wickedness and indulgence, basically what feeds him. And he does this by enhancing the perceivable satisfaction a bioform can obtain through the act of fighting the enemy. Let me explain. The majority of Tyranid bioforms run on instinctive behaviors. These primitive actions are comparable to what we credit our reptilian brain for doing. Things like controlling our breathing, our heart rate, and basic fight and flight responses. 
When Slanesh finally gets a hold of a Tyranid bioform, the first gift he bestows upon his victim is the ability to expand his mind and enhance what would be considered the limbic system to us, which controls emotions, memory, and complex senses. It's not that the hive mind didn't give bioforms these faculties, because Tyranids need the ability to smell their prey, to form memories in order to return back to the correct mycetic spore, it's that these things are enhanced to a level where the Tyranid can experience a true sense of indulgence. For example, a hormagant is bred to seek and kill any living creature with its long bladed talons. That's its role. It has no other desire but to kill. When it gets influenced by Slanesh, the mind of the hormagant is altered in a way that it intensifies the creature's sensory perceptions, giving it a sense of euphoria from the evisceration of the enemy. In other words, the hormagant becomes hypersensitive to sight, sound, and touch, allowing it to find a new sense of satisfaction unlike anything it's felt before as its sighting talons rip through the flesh of its victims and he finds true enjoyment in ending this creature's life. And in a strange way, Slanesh's corruption of a Tyranid actually makes them deadlier. They get a boost of chemicals and hormones surging through their mind and body unlike anything they have felt before. It's almost like a tiny evolutionary leap forward that then makes them become addicted to figuring out new ways of butchering the enemy and trying to prolong the process as much as their primordial brains can resist. Now the reason the God of Exus can do this is because like most biological life, the Tyranids already have these natural mechanisms that reward aggression and violence. For example, the adrenal glands found in most infantry bioforms serve to push a Tyranid into a hyperactive state of frenzy, and then once corrupted by Slanesh, this gets placed into overdrive. We can think of these chaotic mutations of the body and mind of the Tyranids similar to a human on bath salts or some type of intense, almost hallucinogenic drug. In other words, Slanesh corrupted Tyranids are basically just Tyranids on acid. And although the bioform is experiencing its life through this new tinted lens of wonder, the sensation doesn't really last forever, and it becomes its new goal to attain that same level of pleasure in the next kill. And as the kills begin to accumulate, the Tyranid requires ever more extremes of sensation in order to feel that same initial burst of euphoria, basically becoming addicted not just to the act of butchering, but to absorbing as much of the essence of death dealing. So the taste of a victim's panic sweat, the warmth of its organs as it's ripped out of its body, the sound of the screams, even the intensity of the colors displayed on a gore-splattered battlefield. The Tyranid is not just a simple-minded bioform anymore. It is now a death junkie. And again, because the individual bioform is fulfilling its role as a killer, the hive mind is tied down. It might detect that there's something different with this particular hive guard or a termagant, but it's still doing its job. And what begins to happen is that the bioform engages in ever more extreme behavior, chasing that initial high while feeding the prince of pleasure. And so even though there is no technical veneration of Slanesh, the god actually grants these Tyranids ever more mutational gifts in order to drive the Tyranids further down into depravity. Now these chaotic mutations take many forms, but the most common gift of Slanesh are crab-like and barb-scything talons designed to wound more so than kill, lymphatic glands that secrete a substance with a hormone-triggering odor meant to stimulate other Slaneshi Tyranids, sensory receptors that extend out and feed the Tyranid's mind with ever more sensations, multiple eyes that push the boundaries of visual perception, wild and bizarre color patterns, as well as mutating the chitinous armor into elegant and elaborate designs, and then there are the gifts that are not really Really tangible, like the urge to collect trophies from their victims, the Tyranid indulges in not only growing their stockpile, but also finding satisfaction in recalling the murderous act. And the severity of the mutation really depends on how long Slanesh is allowed to corrupt the bioform, because once the hive mind has had enough, the bioform is ordered back into a reclamation pool to be cleansed of his mutations and become nothing more than biomass. But to the bitter end, Slanesh feeds off of the final moments of orgasmic pleasure that the bioform experiences as its body dissolves into nothingness. Now let's take a look at how Nurgle would corrupt the Great Devourer. We first need to understand that the Tyranid race is arguably the biological end to most species' evolutionary trail. They are the supreme mortal beings. Unlike the Chaos Gods that have no threat other than themselves, the Tyranids have had to work unimaginably hard not to get wiped off the face of the universe and attain a position as a galactic apex predator. They've been able to achieve this on every planet and possibly every galaxy they've ever invaded because of how flexible and adaptive the Tyranid hive mind is. 
You see, the Tyranids have evolved the ability of rapid adaptation in accordance to a threat. So for example, when their enemy's plasma weapons are slaughtering their ranks, the hive mind adapts a form of chitinous armor that is less affected by this new projectile. If the world they are consuming is covered in a frozen tundra, the hive mind adapts its bioforms to fight in the freezing temperatures. Basically, there hasn't been anything that the hive mind can't evolve around. And when we look at the diseases created by Nurgle, the hive mind does an incredible job of brushing off any long-term effects of these diseases. This is because the Tyranids encountered infectious pathogens throughout their long history and are no strangers to the occasional ailment. When a breakout of one of Nurgle's poxes or any other diseases is detected by the hive mind, the order to isolate is given to the infected group and they move as far away as possible from any major horde, keeping at least a few synaptic creatures to control the contaminated group. If possible, they will launch themselves into suicide missions or allow the synapse creatures to slaughter the infected. This is obviously done so that the virus cannot spread to the rest of the Tyranid horde. But if quarantine is impossible, let's say maybe they are fighting on a planet infected with the zombie plague, then in that case, the hive mind will create a microscopic bioform that can fight the disease inside of the host cells. This might be different than what we usually think of as a Tyranid, because the most common bioform the Lord talks about are large or giant predators that can stand toe to toe with human soldiers and even titans. But the Tyranids also fight wars on a microscopic level. These wars are so ferocious and brutal that the hive mind has created viruses that have even been found to counteract and hurt plague marines, one of Nurgle's toughest warriors. Now let's say that even these battles are not going in the favor of the Tyranids, and they can't find a way to destroy a malignant bacteria or virus. Then in these situations, the hive mind does something truly incredible. It allows its bioforms to get infected by the disease in order to deconstruct and incorporate the pathogen into its own DNA. This is why tendrils of a high fleet develop very different characteristics over time. They are evolving with whatever it is that's trying to kill them. The longer the Tyranid's genetic makeup can mix with a virus or a bacteria, the more time it has to figure out a way to use it to its advantage. Oftentimes what happens is that the foreign body will be contained and then used as a weapon. As time goes on, this contagion will become less and less dangerous to the Tyranid's base genetic makeup until finally it coexists harmoniously with a specific bioform just like the flesh borer beetles that are used in termagant weapons. They are a living bioform that was developed from the adoption of a foreign life form and is now used as ammunition. Now how long it takes a hive mind to incorporate this new virus into its own DNA is unknown. So for a brief period of time, plague tyranids will exist, but as long as the hive mind is kept pure, the disease can be reverse engineered. Now that we know just how difficult it is for the Tyranids to fall victims to a disease, the question becomes, well how does Nurgle corrupt a high fleet? And to answer that, we must understand why a creature turns to the god of decay in the first place. You see, it's not the actual disease that turns people into Nurgle worshippers, but rather the willful acceptance of his patronage in order to get rid of the pain and suffering caused by the disease. So for example, if you and I would catch the rot, we would be inundated with unbearable pain as our blood curdles in our veins, our eyes slowly fuse together into one globulous orb, and horns sprout from our head. That's when salvation from this torture would be promised by Grandfather Nurgle as his voice calls to us from the immaterium. This is how the god of disease creates his own invitation into our souls. Our only option becomes everlasting life in his servitude or death. And this goes to show why so many humans embrace Nurgle. But when it comes to the Tyranids, no matter how painful it gets, there will always be a mental block controlled by the hive mind forbidding the Tyranid bioform from turning to chaos. And the only way to overcome this is by corrupting the very core of the Tyranid hive mind which means contaminating the entire tendril, if not the entire hive fleet, so that no remnants of the hive mind can regain control of the bioforms. It's as if Nurgle was trying to control our entire bodies by only targeting our toes. It doesn't really work that way. So what Nurgle needs is a disease fast enough to avoid being quarantined, tough enough to survive attacks from tyranid microbioforms, and contagious enough to affect every bioform, including hive ships. Only then could Nurgle begin to whisper into the collective consciousness of the Tyranids and convince them to accept salvation. This is why targeting the hive ships that create and guide all of the Tyranid bioforms is the best tactic for Nurgle. A task that is incredibly difficult because hive ships are protected by the shadow and the warp. Nurgle has no way of knowing how massive a tendril or a hive fleet truly is. It's like fighting an enemy you can't see until it's right in front of you spitting acid in your face. 
So now the question becomes, why would Nurgle go through all the trouble to corrupt a creature that is extremely resilient to the point where an entire planetary cult would have to be wasted in order to corrupt them, and is a species that doesn't even have a soul to consume? The answer lies in Nurgle's desire to create the most virulent disease in the history of the galaxy. You see, if the Plague God can concoct a virus so deadly that even the Great Devourer has trouble getting better from, then what chance does any other race in the galaxy have against such a deadly disease? This essentially makes the Tyranids the stone upon which Nurgle sharpens his rust-encrusted blade. Nurgle's rot becomes stronger every time it gets eradicated by the High Fleet, and while it seems like the Tyranids win the majority of the time, Nurgle is happy to play the long game because his diseases are getting stronger. But now that we know all of this, let's get to the fun part of the video where we go over the terrifying records of Tyranid warbands infected by one of Nurgle's contagions, starting with the bioforms that carry the disease known as the Chortling Morin. In a normal sentient being, this ailment causes a victim to laugh themselves to death. Within the Tyranids, however, the symptoms of this disease causes every Tyranid, from the Termagant to Flying Hive Tyrants, to spill forth an uncontrollable and horrifying cackling sound akin to a human's laughter. And because the Tyranid's biology is so resilient, death takes longer to arrive, and by the time the disease finally kills the gargoyle or the gene stealer, its nightmarish laughter has ingrained itself into the psyche of any survivor. Next are the Tyranids infected by the chaos-infused virus known as Zombie Plague. This is a gift from Nurgle that slowly causes the skin, armor, and eventually the internal organs of a Tyranid to rot away. The eyes are some of the first pieces of soft tissue that decay away, so the resilient Tyranid body compensates for the lack of vision by creating bioforms with a superior form of bat-like sonar. High-pitched clicking sounds are emitted from these zombie Tyranids until even those organs decay at which point a less effective but equally deadly bioform is left to wander around the battlefield attacking anything it can get its hands on. And then there are the Tyranids infected by the Destroyer Plague, where the abdomen of a bioform becomes bloated until it bursts, releasing wave after wave of Tyranid-like plague flies. These Destroyer Tyranids have flies coming out of every orifice, with new boils bubbling up daily as pus leaks from open wounds and more flies nest back into the body of the Tyranids until the creature is entirely consumed by these demonic flies. And these are just a few of the many types of diseases Nurgle has used on the Tyranids. Since the opening of the Great Rift, the influence of chaos has grown throughout the galaxy, and with it, the battles between the Great Devourer and Nurgle. And the final faction that we're going to take a look at are the Orcs. How would chaos corrupt the Greenskins? Orcs are very rarely corrupted by chaos, but some of the more vicious Orc war bosses or psychotic weird boys will seek to serve the cause of the Dark Gods in return for the power they grant them. These Orcs are known as Chaos Renegade Orcs, but to their fellow Orcs, they are known as traitors. There are many different ways an Orc falls to Chaos. Most often, a Chaos God or Demon will be the first to communicate with the Orc. A Demon or Chaos God will entice an Orc with promises of a better fight, or the powers to crush the heads of his enemies. In Orc culture, positions of power are constantly being challenged. If the Defender is defeated, the loser returns to a mob a demoted orc boy. But if the position of a war boss is challenged and the reigning boss is defeated, the former war boss is exiled. It is these defeated and shamed orc war bosses that draw the attention of the ruinous powers. Defeated or not, an orc war boss is still a massive powerful creature, still capable of killing a space marine. These creatures provide the perfect foundation a demon is looking for when seeking to possess a vessel in real space. Most outcast war bosses are also accompanied by their former knobs that were also pushed out of the tribe during the schism. The Chaos God will then have not only a powerful war boss, but also his retinue of aggressive and war-hardened knobs. The ruinous powers are also attracted to those weird boys who become addicted to their psychic powers often and eventually becoming deadly dangers to their own tribe. When these warpheads, as they are known, begin experimenting with psychic abilities, they invite demons to enter their bodies, in order to feel greater etheric powers coursing through their bodies. Some of these renegade orc psychers become demon hosts, which make them even more dangerous to the tribe and are oftentimes exiled. However, if the demon is powerful enough, he will use the weird boy to spread his chaotic taint throughout the entire tribe. 
in this way. Entire orc camps can be influenced by chaos. Because the orc race wages war all over the galaxy, they have inevitably come into contact with chaotically corrupted planets. Orc rocks have landed on alien worlds already infected with chaos. After properly destroying whatever chaotic cult exists on the planet, they are left alone with whatever catalyst led the previous inhabitants into chaos. The Greenskins have discovered ancient ruins created to venerate the chaos gods, and through establishing camps in these ruins, the orcs begin to hear screams and suffer from nightmarish visions. The new inhabitants are haunted by these dreams, and slowly they hear the call of chaos. Other orcs have come across ancient and powerful chaotic weapons, capable of incredible destruction. Devices that allow them to survive through the most painful injuries, or weapons capable of shooting out warp lightning that disintegrates the enemies. As the orc wields his long forgotten demotically possessed war gear, he too begins to turn to chaos. The green skin race is most desired by corn and orc boys are more likely to turn to the teachings of Korn, more so than any other chaos god. The savagery and uncontrollable desire to go to war exhibited by the orcs goes perfectly with Korn's philosophy. Boys that have sworn their soul to the god of war and murder find the need to spill blood for the blood god in addition to craving hand-to-hand -hand battles. They also develop a desire to collect their enemy skulls. When the blood god's powers finally turn and flow through an orc, it turns his skin red. Corn worshipping orcs are known as red orcs or coronet orcs. They no longer sport the notable green skin that they are most known for. The storm boys are the most susceptible odd boys to worship corn, because corn is also the god of martial honor and glory. His teachings are accepted by the battle drilled units of storm boys. While Korn himself would more than likely not empower a coronet storm boy, the rocket pack wearing boy would still venerate the god of war. While the average orc already fights for combat prowess and the thrill of melee, a red orc's bloodlust is increasingly uncontrollable and requires them to engage in the most heinous forms of violence to maintain even a semblance of control. Meaning that when an average orc would move on to fight a tougher opponent, a red orc will not stop smashing down his axe on the skull of his enemy, even if the enemy died long ago. A red orc that is denied the chance to engage in constant slaughter will become almost uncontrollably enraged and will turn on any living thing whose life can be extinguished. It needs to satisfy this sheer need of carnage. This is why most red orcs are instantly pushed out of a regular orc tribe killed or given a snickers. Along with red skin, a coronet orc will begin to notice an increase in overall size and power. The blessings of corn mix with the natural biology of the orcs. The more aggressive and battle hardened an orc gets, the larger he grows. Red orc war bosses are some of the most massive creatures. Long, twisting horns, a protruding jaw, bone spiked fist, and multi rowed teeth are gifts bestowed on a red orc, empowered or possessed by corn. A massive axe capable of taking out a rhino transport, or a demonic mace capable of batting away a space marine drop pod. Corn's gifts to a red orc warboss are always maliciously destructive. Nurgle is another chaos god that often finds a way to infest the orc race. Almost as common as corn, Nurgle's touch is felt by many greenskins that cannot escape the ever-changing disease and viruses that Papa Nurgle spreads planet to planet. When an orc tribe plucks a presumably abandoned spacehawk from the sky, they cannot always kill off all of the disease-ridden crew. The contagion spreads from plague-filled spacehawk to the invading orc population. Within days, the battle turns from killing plague cultists to killing plague orcs. When orcs are infected by Nurgle, their blood curdles in their veins. Their eyes grow together into a single, globulous orb, and a horn sprouts from their head. The illness does not merely affect the body, however. It painfully corrupts the diseased orc soul, to the point where the victim has to either end his own life or fully embrace the way of Grandfather Nurgle. 
this form of possession completely changes the orcs and actually brings down their desire to fight. This lack of aggression creates a former husk of what an orc used to be. They shrink in size and their dying bodies are constantly spewing out pus filled with infected orc spores. These spores rarely create more plague orcs but instead morph into deformed Nurgle squigs. The purpose of a plague orc is simple, spread the gift of Nurgle by infecting as many living creatures as they can. Death is welcomed by these possessed orcs and so their prowess in battle is horrible. Killing a plague orc is as easy as killing a cultist, but Grandfather Nurgle has better use for plague orcs than conquest. When Nurgle infects the Greenskins, it is to test his contagion on a population of creatures with a superb immune system. Orc physiology is the fusion of fungus and animal cells. It works not only to survive extremely brutal injury, but also it is incredibly good at fighting pathogens on a molecular level. The fungal cells of an orc are able to react to diseases and kill whatever cell has already been infected. In a way, the orc cells fight each other and slowly the orc heals himself of the pathogen or virus. This advanced healing is something designed in every orc by their makers, the old ones. What makes them one of the galaxy's most tenacious survivors also makes them perfect for Nurgle's testing. Possession by Slanesh is extremely rare. The few orcs that have fallen to the Prince of Pleasure's temptations are lured in by the spoils of war. Orcs tend to be possessive of their weapons, and Slaneshi cults have tried to coerce orc freebooter captains with shiny weapons, but most orcs tend to lose interest of their riches if no one is there fighting them for it. There have been tales of a pyromaniac war boss that sold his soul to Slaanesh for an etheric flame that never extinguished. The orc war boss took the flame and set his rival tribe's camp ablaze. To his complete joy, the flame kept spreading until the entire planet went up in flames. The war boss roared with joy as he himself burned to death. Zinch is an even rarer chaos god that looks to the orcs. The only orcs that have been touched by the powers of the chaos god Zinch have been weird boys seeking ever greater warp powers. Powers they believe could not be provided by Gork or Mork. Unfortunately, orcs are always pawns of the master of fate. It has to be noted that even though some orc war bosses have used chaos renegade orcs in their war bands, the average orc warlord would rather kill a chaos possessed orc before he fights alongside him. Most chaos orcs are pushed out of the normal orc culture and should one chaotically gifted orc rise, a proper orc war boss would do everything in his power to show this spiky loving git who's really the biggest and the baddest. And that concludes our deep dive into the Warhammer 40k lore. If you guys want to hear more about chaos, check out our deep dive on the chaos space marines. I'll put a link up above or in the description below. It's a really good video. Now, if you guys enjoy these types of videos, help me out by hitting the like button, sharing with your friends, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already, and comment something, whatever you want. Let me know which faction you would want to see corrupted and have a model, because as far as I know, none of these guys have an actual model that GW has created. Again, I hope you guys enjoyed. Don't forget to share with your friends, and if you guys want to support the channel, you can with a super thanks or hitting us up on Patreon. The link is in the description. Thank you guys so much for listening. This was Gersh One with One Mind Syndicate signing out.